opportunity for today. So, Father, we thank you for this day and opportunity we have to gather with you. We thank you for your provision, your love, and your just your sustaining grace and all you do to provide for us in and through and all the situations in, in our lives. Thank you for the lessons that you give in each opportunity um, through the mental, the physical, the financial, spiritual, just all the challenges you put before us, the obstacles, the, the pitfalls, the, the highs, the lows, the mountaintop and valley experiences. Help us to just see your hand in it all and your purpose in it all and just your way and your will uh, being just revealed into our lives as we are walking in and, and out your, your sovereign decree that you want what's best for us. So we just continue to thank you and um, just wow, just the moments we look about with Elijah and what he was going through and looking at how you were unfolding before him, the, the calling in his life. Even though it was hard to understand at the time, a lot of different things must have obviously went through his mind and his experiences. As we see, we are no different. And we also have the opportunities to always learn and grow from the things that you put into our lives. So be with each and every one of us, Father, strengthen where there needs to be physical strength and financial and emotional and, and mental and just the whole spiritual girding up of our loins and making sure we're ready even more so to receive the closeness and time with you, the next opportunities to learn from you, and then that one day you call us home to be your own. So we thank you for all you do and all you can have done and continue to do in our lives as our our God and our Father, our Shepherd, our Counselor, our Teacher, our Pastor in this time. We ask you to be with us in these ways to guide and direct us and teach us and again and comfort us and encourage us and convict us where need be to be better and to be encouraged not to feel bad but to get feel yet challenged to know that it's part of growth it's part of dealing with our sin nature to go through some times of self-reflection and getting better and improving and progressing so we thank you so much that you teach us these lessons now be with us as we look through the story of Elijah and Elisha to show more of these things in this story. We thank you for the preparations you give to us in and through your word and your presence in our lives. We ask all these things in Jesus' issue, his name we pray, amen. All right, so uh, today's lesson will be the continuation of Elijah and Elisha. We're on part seven now of this typology uh, study, which has been quite a while. We had a break, and now we're back together again. But it bears always to mind when we're doing that type of break. It's been so long. Well, I was going to go through a review in any event, but even more so since we've been gone for a part for a while. For a while. So we're going to pick up in chapter 19 today and really complete chapter 19, but to kind of remind us about what's going on with Elijah and Elisha. So Elijah and Elisha are both on the scene in northern Israel, and they are in the time of the uh, mid-800s. Yes? So we have Marilyn, Tracy, Laney, Sandy, Pam, and Todd. Well, hello, everybody. Good morning. And so we are in uh, the time frame, don't forget, of the um, 870 all the way through 850 to uh, when you're looking at Elijah's ministry where he passed on the baton to Elisha. They're both for northern Israel. They're the first prophets that come on the scene that start to do miraculous things. That did not happen until you got the gap between them and Moses and Joshua as they are a type of that. Then we looked at how the, when, Joshua, when Elijah comes onto the scene, he just bursts forth and says, it's not going to rain. We don't know his genealogy. Of course, he has one. He's from Gilead. But we don't know what it is. All we know is he comes in. He just bust, burst in and says, oh, by the way, uh, there's going to be a famine. Uh, not famine. There's going to be no, no rain or dew on the land until I say so. The, what is that all about? He just walks away. Like, that's kind of crazy. And it speaks to the fact that a year into the tribulation period, under the man of sin, the white horse, there'll be a transitional son of destruction, red horse manifestation of the Antichrist in which he will take the rain and dew. Uh, the dew is the constant everyday aspect of the, the scripture is always there. And the rain speaks of those flowing conversations we can have in speaking about Christ and about God and things of scripture. And that rain and dew, the, the ability to communicate will be seen as hate speech, talking about God, Jesus, Bible. The ability to have the scripture even referenced to you is the dew that's there every morning available to you will be taken. And that's a year into the period. Yeah, year into And why, why do I say that, you say? Because I get that from Elijah's story because he goes over after that statement. He goes over across the, the river and he's, he's with a brook with water by God that the water dries up a year later. And that's why I say it's a year. And then after that, he travels way up here to Zarephath with a widow and her, and her son, which is again ironic that we look with Obadiah's comments not the prophet Obadiah but the Obadiah servant of Ahab we find that he later on makes reference to 
when he encounters him. How am I going to know if I go back and tell Ahab, you're just going to transport yourself, God's going to transport you. So he makes a comment as if to say this has been what they probably were thinking before must have happened because you don't scale the area and not find him. And if he's just traversing normally, it must have been God, like a Philip and Enoch situation. He just push, push him up here. Um, then you know, he just transports him. So I'm thinking that's what happened. We don't know that for certain, but it's quite a trek to go from here to here and not be seen when Ahab is diligently looking for you to kill you. It's kind of interesting. So in any event, then we find out when Elijah's up there for two years, we find he, he kind of gets a kinship, understandably so, to this widow and her son. And he gets a kinship to her and he to, she to him, and they start having an affinity, I would say, toward each other. Nothing unscriptural, nothing ungodly about it. It's all relevant and emotional, natural things. They develop a, a kinship for each other, a love, I would say, that he starts to, I guess you would, not to be tongue in cheek about it, but like play house a little bit. And so then you have that sense of, he's thinking, well, I'm gonna have a family. And uh, God says, uh, no, you're not. And, the, and of course, the widow's son dies. He's like, oh my gosh. She says, it's because of what she did, he says because of what he did, and they both understand what they did was wrong because they put their emphasis on each other and not the Lord, which speaks to a lot of different things and how you need to take your calling of God, just like those who are married, the Lord comes first. It goes God, then husband, wife, then children, right? You don't put your spouse. I know there's so many different people that are married today that say my spouse comes first no matter what. And some take that out of context, and they'll say, oh, that means... I'm not gonna, I'm gonna ignore my wife when she's crying. Well, somebody actually told me this, by the way, that that was in marriage counseling. I'm going to ignore her when she's crying or in an emotional state because I have my time with God. I'm gonna spend time studying the Bible. Okay, if you do that, you're a moron. Okay, that's not what I'm saying, okay? So people took that the wrong way and they go, oh, you said God first and wife second. I'm like, are you kidding me right now? Do you actually think I meant that? That's not what I'm talking about. So uh, obviously the needs of what's coming up with the emotional and physical needs that someone has for you to be there for them, you're there for them. Okay, don't get ignorant. I'm talking about the value internally based, how the high value is placed internally is the primary. And then externally it's expressed in various ways depending on the situation. It's the internal disposition that you have to have that it's God then, then spouse. But this person actually told me, no, my wife doesn't, I, I told her, cry your own self to sleep or you know, spend your own time home from work because you had a bad day. I don't care what talk to you. I'm going to spend time with God. That's my time with God. I'm like, are you kidding me? No, Preston said so. No, I didn't say that. That is not what I'm saying, okay? That's never what I ever said. And if you'll take it, so I'll make sure I'm clear when I say that. And that's what happened with Elijah and, and, and the Zarephath widow, the widow and Zarephath and her son, is that he and she were, were in essence, they were, in fact, saying, you know what? There's a lot. There's, a, there's an ease ability for a sinful person, who's who has needs of the physical reality. The scriptural devotion this week on Friday talked about this. It's very easy to put the physical needs ahead of the spiritual realities. The spiritual blessings tend to come second when the physical benefits are right in front of you. It's hard. It's hard to say the physical benefits don't matter as much as the spiritual blessing. Don't tell me it's easy because it's hard. It's very hard. And that's what Elijah's dealing with. So I don't want to make fun of him by any way. I'm not making fun of the widow by any means. I'm just calling it for what it is. They put the physical benefits of their kinship, of their two years of growing together as a family unit. They're acting like a family. God said the oil, the oil and, and, and the flour would not diminish until the famine was over. The rain started raining again. So they had nothing to worry about there. Provisions were there from a substance standpoint. Provision was there from a love standpoint. What, what else do you need in life? If you have someone that loves you and you have sustenance, of course, bu above it all is God himself, wh wh where's your concerns? You don't have any, right? So they're in a really, and given the whole land has just been devastated with no rain and dew, they're living in like a little bubble of, of awesome physical blessings, physical benefits. So it's easy to forget the spiritual blessing provided the physical benefit, easy to forget that. And that's what I'm saying happened. So I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying. Love is not bad. Loving someone who's your husband and wife is not bad. Loving in general is not bad. It's not bad. What's bad is when you put that physical benefit of what that love does ahead of the spiritual blessing that provided that love for you. That is what is wrong. And that's what happened with Elijah and with the widow. And then you find that when God took the boy's life and then he brought him back to life, when they both took ownership for it, they realized that God was got a wake up call and Elijah's like, I, I gotta go. That's when he knew, I gotta go. And, he, and, and God says, you go right now and you, put, you present yourself they have and you tell him that you know basically you're back in the game you're going to start you're, gonna, you're now it's time and now three years has gone by he goes back 
And then, of course, he runs into Obadiah at this time, who's looking with Ahab. They're looking for some, for some water for their animals. If they don't find any water and food, they're going to then kill their animals and eat them for food. Because they're going to either keep them alive for sustenance to keep them to, to, to work where they need to have them for usage. Or if not, they can't, if they can't use them because they're going to be dying because they have no food, well, then heck no, man. We're just going to kill those bad boys and have them for food. Either way, they're looking for food. And they're looking, they're traversing this whole land. And that took many months, remember? So the three years that he announces it, one year here, two years here, six months went by during this whole traversing, which led us to the Mount Carmel experience. And Obadiah represented that, that double-minded person, if you remember, because he would say, hey, hey, remember what I did? I, I fed the people, the prophets. I hid them in a cave. I hid two different groupings of them in two different caves. Aren't you proud of me? It reminds me of the Matthew 7, 22. Lord, Lord, we say unto you, we did many things. We cast out that God says, that's not the point, is it? The point is not what you did. It's why you did it. It's the how and the why behind it. John, he, he was there at the south. He, he did that on his own husband. He yeah. Yeah, he went. He, yeah, he traversed that. He did not, yeah. God did not, tra he traversed that. And he gets down there, and you know this because Obadiah encounters him. And, and, and so you, he encounters him, and then you have this whole process of, of thought where now he then en encounters Ahab, and Ahab says, are you the one who's been, you know, the one who's been the, the antagonist, the troublemaker of Israel? And he, I just like, oh, are you kidding me right now? I'm the one? No, you and your entire family is the one. So interesting how people deflect onto others what they themselves have the problem with, isn't it? So people say, the Bible's not filled with all the answers in life. If you look hard enough and, and long enough, and you just keep on spending time with it, all the answers from psychology to financial to physical to mental to spiritual, it's all in there, man. Men with Meyer calls that primary projection. Primary projection is what men with Meyer calls that. But some, I've heard some people call it displaced anger or just, you, you just, you're projecting onto someone else what you yourself have as a fault. And Ahab is the one who is doing he, 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 You can't not know. He's the one who rebuilt Jericho when it was told not to do it. And if you did, you'd be cursed. Joshua said so. He does it anyways. <laughs> then, he, then he marries a, a, a lady who's got some serious problems, by the way. He's from a Phoenician background. And the Phoenicians have ties to the Canaanites. And the Canaanites have ties to, hello, hybrid giants. Are you surprised that her, her false idol worship of Baal is anything to be surprised about? And her name, Jezebel, has a root of that. It's, it's unbelievable how he, he knew. There's everything about her that said, not good people. <laughs> and she goes, oh, I love you. Are you kidding me right now? She comes from a stock of, of, of bad history. She's continuing that bad history. And her name's named after that bad history. And you're going to go, oh, let's get married. What yeah. was her name? I'm just saying Jezebel, the last name Baal, has that, their Baal. The Baal is a, or she's named after the Baal god, the false and, worship. And even vet cosmetically and dress-wise, she was more attractively presented than the Jewish lady. Oh, you, oh yeah, I, I would imagine she probably had um, some different, uh, she's probably like Naaman in a lot of ways, probably, I'm sure. Because when she spoke, you see how Elijah later on reacts, and I'll look at this in a minute. But I, I would contend that she was not like Naaman the same exact way, but in a similitude to that, that she was, more of more of girth, more of beauty. She was she was wise. She had intelligence. She had beauty, and she had strength. And so it, it but she used it for evil purposes. Obviously, that's probably how she wooed Ahab in, no doubt about it. So, but anyway, I'm not going to defend him. He still did a wrong thing, and God said he did evil in the sight that all the kings would pour after him. So he has no excuse, I'm not justifying his actions at all. He's a, he's guilty. I'm not trying to put it all on Jezebel. So, but the reality is that then we pick up the story when we saw that, that, that they're here and he says, okay, you know, gather your folks on, onto Mount Carmel, let's meet there. And then all of a sudden they all go to Mount Carmel right here. All right, so you, this is the highlight of the story we're reviewing where we're gonna pick up at. So they go to Mount Carmel and, and Elijah, it's hilarious because he, he begins to, to, to mock their God as they are doing this from like morning to noon, from noon to six. I mean, they are going at this for a long time. They almost, in essence, they are like a precursor to how the crucifixion itself, when Satan tried to have his heyday and victory, and it looked like he was winning. When you look at the crucifixion and you forget about the resurrection, you're like, well, he looked, he, he, got, a, he got the upper hand here. So it looked like, it looks like the prophets of Baal who have the stage, they have the show, they, they're doing all, they're thrusting them, they're jumping and throwing themselves on the altar. They're, it's just, it, they're making a, a joke of themselves. And Elijah from 12 to 3, 
which is the exact time on the cross Jesus was quiet. There was silence between the God the Father and God the Son, like the curtain was pulled back. There was darkness on the face of the earth. There was this quietness as if God in that way was saying, Satan, this is not your victory. This is just part of my process of redemption. And like kindred spirit, Elijah is, is taking what Satan thinks, what they think is their hour with their false god, and he mocks them. Oh, what's the matter? Is he, is he, is he uh, sleeping? Is he, is he too busy? And he's just mocking him in every capacity that he can, which is, I think is just tremendous. And now he's doing this. I think it's great. I love it. And with this in, in, encounter, we see that the, the typology of this encounter of this Mount Carmel reference, references back in um, Revelation 11, 7. It says the two witnesses have a polemos or a battle or a strife with the beast. And if you remember that, so we're just going to review right now. So that's what's in the scripture. And so you see this, they had this battle and this strife with the beast, which is what we see in Mount Carmel. The, he's having this waged confrontation, which he wins. <laughs> and then you see them, uh, then he take, and then later on, you don't know how they're killed exactly. It just says he cast them into the valley uh, below there, and yet in the valley plain of Jezreel. But yet later on, Ahab then says in chapter 19, as we pick it up, chapter 19, verse 1, Ahab says, well, wait a minute, he slayed the prophets with a sword. Ahab said that. So you're like, wait a second. So he said he threw him down on the plain of Jezreel earlier, but yet Ahab says later on he slain with the sword, which means he slew him with the sword, and then he cast him off the cliff, which speaks to the avenue of the, of the Jehoshaphat a avenue, because what happens in Jehoshaphat? People are cut by the sword, one of Jesus on the white horse, and their blood is then filling up the valley of Jehoshaphat. Right? That's not a coincidence. You have this, you have this imagery of, of God having a statement of finality of, of this. So he was done with this issue. So then when you look at later on, when he goes and he, and he, and he starts to uh, tell Ahab, you go ahead, you, you go back, and, and then, he, then God tells him, you go, and he outruns him. So Ahab's in a chariot, for crying out loud, leaving. Then it says in chapter 18 that he outran him. Like, that's pretty quick feet fleet of foot. So interesting, back up latter part of chapter 18, a couple of things to think about. Up in verse 42 to 45 of chapter 18, it says that he said to his servant, go now and look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, now wait a minute, the servant, people say, oh, that's Elisha. No, no, no. Elisha doesn't come into view until chapter 19 at the end. So who's the servant? Obadiah. No, no, no. Not Obadiah because he was the servant to Ahab not a servant to Elijah. So the only thing left you have is the widow's son potentially was with him the whole time. And I believe the widow's son represents the typology of the heirs of the Sporos. The heirs of the Sporos. And so there's, because he was the one who was, again, under his two years of being with Elijah. Elijah is a type of those two witnesses in the first half of tribulation, putting forth the testimony so that those of Sporos who would have ears to hear would hear, because they need to know how to endure the hell on earth they're going to have to deal with for the entire tribulation period. And so here you have, and he says, which is why interesting, he says in verse 43 at the very end, after he said, he went up and he looked and said, there is nothing, and he said, go again seven times. Again, speaking to the completion of tribulation, seven years, speaking to the type of this widow's son, represents the heirs of Sporos who have to be here for the entire seven years. That's why he's saying that. But then he says in verse 44, and it came to pass at the seventh time at the end, behold, there arise a thick cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And I believe this is an imagery of typology speaking to the clouds of the heaven parting. And here you have the white horse and there's Jesus. Yes, you are coming back. Boy, that's a sight to see. When you've been on on earth for the last three and a half years of Jacob's trouble, demonic activity unparalleled, Satan running amok. That's the, that's the greatest sign you ever could see. Having the clouds part and God coming down on a white horse, yahoo, baby. I can just imagine the shouts of, on the earth of those who were like, no more hiding, no more running. We're good now, we're free. And so here you have, and it says like a man's hand, and it says in a man's foot in the Septuagint, but a man's hand it says in the exegesis. And he says, and he, and he said, go up and say unto Ahab, Prepare your chariot and get thee out, get thee down from the rain, 
get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. And it came to pass that meanwhile that the heaven was black and darkened with clouds and winds. And there was a great rain. Again, I think this is referencing the black and darkness. The cloud of thick darkness speaks to God coming in a lot of judgment, which he know happens in the end of tribulation in type of Gog and Magog battle two and Jehoshaphat itself. All that's going on in typology from this imagery you see here. And he's telling Ahab to hightail it. Out of there. Yeah. Pam said, I think there's a total of eight times. He said seven times to go again. Yep, yep, you got it. I got you. You're correct. Thank you. So, and I, sorry, I didn't emphasize that. You're correct, because he says, and he said in seven, he said, go back and turn back seven times, and it came to pass at the seventh time. He said, behold, arise, a thick cloud. So when he came back and saw that, to your point, he went seven times, and at the seventh time, it says in verse 44, which remember, there's no ordinal cardinal stuff in the Hebrew, and so it is the seventh time he sees this. But to your point, though, it was after that that he sees what's interesting about it, he says, out of the sea. And out of the sea, where they're at is right here. So if he's looking out to here, this is the sea he's talking about. So there's a hand that, that you imagine that? So there's a hand that comes out of the, the sea, it says. And he says, a thick, a thick cloud like a hand. So there's a thick cloud, just to kind of think that, a cloud out of the water. That's not normal. Okay, let's get real. That's not normal. So there's a thick a, a cloud, looks like a hand. It's coming like a, like a hand, it's just coming out like this and going over here. Now that's weird. Now, come on. If you see any kind of cloud at all coming out of the, out of the water, it's going to freak you out, let alone in the form of a hand. I mean, that's crazy. And then, it, then it comes out of the water and just goes over and like as if, as if to say, whoosh, here's your water on your land. So do I think it's the eighth time to your point? I think, so it's the seventh time that he went, it says in verse 44, and it, and it came to pass at the seventh time he came, he said, behold, but you would say that to your point though, that it was after he went to, se so I would say he went the seventh time and he was watching it. And then after he was watching it, then he saw, so I think it's, he saw it, he went the seventh time, but then after he looked, then it says, again, he said, behold, there arises a thick cloud out of the sea. So it was after he went the seventh time and then after he was there looking, so he was already there the seventh time looking, nothing had happened. And then all of a sudden he saw that. So that could be, you could say it's after the seventh time it happened. It didn't like happen on the seventh time. It happened after he was there the seventh time because he was looking and then he goes, oh my goodness, look at that. That cloud coming up out of the water over Israel. And, and that just must have been a tremendous sight to see. And he goes in and says that, that the, again, the heavens was black and thick clouds and wind, there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel and the hand of the Lord was on Elijah and he gripped, girded up his loins and ran before Ahab. Now this is where, there's no way he's going to tell Ahab to get out. We, we go back to four. He says, uh, and Ahab rode out. Uh, let me see here. Ahab rode out here. Ahab rode out, which is on his chariot. You're going to tell me Ahab rode out to Jezreel ahead of Elijah, and Elijah outran him on his own might? No, because God tells it. God says it right there at the end of the verse. And the Lord, and the Lord, the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins and he ran before Ahab. He ran. There's no way he can outrun a chariot. Just one-on-one, -on -one, there's no way. So God must have given him extra measure of like uh, transportation there to get him ahead, get him a lot of head start, <laughs> and he outran him to Jezreel. So God must have transported him ahead of him, and he ran ahead to Jezreel. Again, God did this, I believe, twice here and then here. Yes? Pam said it was the seventh time of the go again. Yes. I'm with, yes. That's what I'm, yep. The go again. When he said go again seven times, and then the seventh time, on the, on the seventh time he went, he was looking, and then that's when he saw it after that. Because he was like looking, nothing was there. And he, oh, behold, look, I see a, a, a cloud out of the water like a hand. Yeah. And Todd said it was on the eighth time that he actually went to the sea is when he saw the hand. Okay, so when you're saying eighth time, that's where I'm getting... Because I know that in the Greek language, in the cardinal ordinal things, I would definitely get that. But you don't, that's a cardinal ordinal thing from the Greek um, language part of it. That's not part of the Hebrew part of it. So I'm trying to figure out when you're saying eighth. So when they say seventh in the Greek language, it would mean number eight. 
but in the Hebrew language, it just means the seven. So I'm trying to figure out, is that what you're referring to? But Because, hey, that's fine. If, if, I, if I got it wrong, got it wrong. But I'm trying to figure out what I'm, what I'm missing. I think that's what I'm said the initial time when the servant went to the sea doesn't huh? count. Oh, gotcha, 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 gotcha. My part, I, I missed the only part. See, thank you so much. See, thank you. The first time when he went, got you. I got you. So when he went in verse 43, he went up and he said, "Go turn back, go again seven times. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. See, I knew I was missing something. So you're correct. So on the seventh time, on the seventh time he went, of that group of seven, that was, that was following the earlier one time he went. I understand now. My apology. I thought you were saying something different. I knew I had to figure this out. I, okay, you're right. My apologies. Pam said yes. Got you. My apologies. I forgot. I missed that. I missed what you were saying there. You're talking about not, I was thinking you were, you were referring to the seventh times and that word number seventh. You're not referring to that at all. You're referring to the fact he went originally, then he comes back and Elijah says, go seven more times which means seven plus one is eight, which means on the eighth time is when he saw it. Got it, thank you. Okay, so, which, which again speaks to when you have the one time he went, then the seven, so you do have seven still there representing that tribulation period, but you have one now separated from seven equaling eight. So why the one separated from seven? One's always a symbol for unity, obviously we know that. So, I, I mean, it, it's in lieu of that a avenue of looking at it that way, I was looking at just the seven itself isolated, but when you add in the previous one, that speaks to I, what you would think is the unification, the unifying aspect of the heirs, which I was mentioning before on Q&A, that back in, back in the days, of, excuse me, in the days now, from back to now of our Christianity, we have denominationalism left and right and to the front. But in the days of the tribulation period, it's not gonna matter. You're not gonna have people talking about Methodist, Presbyterian, Baptist, all this stuff. You're going to either you're going to believe in God and trust in His Word to the same level, and it's going to be a, a unity of mindset, which I believe that one's talking about. Now that I'm thinking about that when you separated that out from the start, I missed that. But that's what that's 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 speaking to to me. It goes back to what I said on Friday. There's going to be again a, a similitude of mindset. There's not going to be anything of divisiveness or divisions or differences for those who are heirs, for those who are heirs of Sporos, who are going to be here for the whole seven years. They're going to be unified as one. So we're not going to be, hey, let's go do this in a Pentecostal way versus a Presbyterian way versus an Episcopal or Methodist way. It's not going to be that way. Whatever they were before in Christ, the fact that they are now heirs of Sporos, none of that stuff matters anymore. None of it. They left it behind. It's, it's old school stuff. It's old. That's, that's not the, that doesn't, doesn't matter anymore. That's why I think that refers to that you're bringing that up. And I, sorry that I missed that. Um, that's on me. So, is that good? I hope that makes sense. So, so when you go forward on, on this particular passage here, again, he, when, he, when he says the, you know, this whole thick clouds and so forth, again, I just think it's just an amazing thing for, for them to have seen this, for, for Ahab to have seen this, which speaks to, it wasn't, just, it wasn't just the servant that saw it first. In time, a cloud coming up like a hand, everyone's going to see it which is talking about how every eye would see him on that day when he comes again. There's not gonna be, you know, some folks who go, I missed the whole white horse thing. <laughs> no, you're gonna see it. Folks in heaven are gonna see it from that perspective. Folks on earth are gonna see it from their perspective. Whether you're following the Antichrist, who's now the beast, whether you're an heir who's been beheaded under the altar, whether you're an heir running for your life, whether you're the Sumedicoi, whoever you are, you're seeing this. It, it's open for everybody to see and just imagine that, that site. And remember, remember, it just, it just, and by the way, you saw how there was nothing that that this servant had to do, nor Elijah had to do or say. He just said, go look and you'll see it. Meaning, I believe this also speaks to what debate people have when they say, will Jesus come back and have the armies of heaven with him and we'll battle with him? He doesn't need us. We're there, but as witnesses. Just like they're here as witnesses. There's no need to do anything. He doesn't need us to do what he's gonna be doing to bring an end to all this evil on this earth at that time in tribulation. Put an end to the false prophet, the antichrist. They'll be cast in the lake of fire. They'll change Satan. He'll do the Joseph act, do the Gog and Magog number two. All this stuff's gonna happen. Yes? So that cloud represents the Satan nation. Does it say the hand of the hand of God? The hand of God, yeah. Do we say anything, it's right, the hand of God, and yet you have the hand of God mentioned later on 
uh, in this consecutive order of things in the book of Daniel, when he says, you've been judged and found lacking, the hand came out right on the wall. That happened later. That was later. That was a good, roughly 300 years later of that nature. So about 300 years later is when that happened. It's, it's, it's rather interesting how you see all of this kind of happen and transpire, how I'm just thinking if I may have, I mean, I'd be like Elijah was later on. I'd be like, I'd be scared out of my mind if I saw that. And I can imagine when he's, when he's going down to Jezreel, what he's about to tell Je Jezebel, which is why he starts off with, you ain't gonna believe what I just saw, basically. Um, so he goes in and says that in verse 19, ver chapter 19, verse one. And he says that, and Ahab told Jezebel all Elijah had done, and now he slaughtered the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel, and watch this now in verse two, chapter 19, she, she sent a messenger unto Elijah saying, so let the gods or Elohim work to me and more also if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. Now, when it's, when she, now look at verse three and he says, and when he saw that, when he saw that, saw what? I'm telling you, Jezebel sent a messenger, a demonic spirit to him and he saw that and got scared. That's why he got scared. It didn't say he heard that. It says he saw that. And that word saw is that word ra, raha. It, it speaks to that fact that he, the same word we saw back in our study of Genesis and, and Ham. And people always write articles about Ham didn't do anything wrong. It was, it was his son. Well, Ham, Ham, what was he doing there in his father's tent to begin with? What was he doing there? Number one, he had no business being there, looking in his tent. Number two, why he just see and do nothing about it? Why? Remember that? Those are two things you cannot avoid. You can't say, he's innocent. Innocent of what? That's like, <laughs> that's like the bank gets robbed, and I go, I wasn't part of the crew that robbed it. I didn't have any guns. But I was right there. I watched the whole thing happen, though, no, officer. Did you do anything? Nope. Didn't call a soul. Did you see guns being pulled? Yep, I saw it all. Yep, I saw it all. I did nothing, though. No, I'm not at fault. I did nothing. Did nothing? You, you, that, you can't just do that. They're going to pull you in as a suspect and question you, left and right. Yeah, you can't just not do anything, right? So anyway, yeah, sense of omission. So, and they call that sometimes if they have ju just cause for being an accomplice to the crime or aiding and abetting a crime, all the different legal terminology I want to get involved in, they, they would categorize that stuff. So that's what, that's the, that what when you see the same word you say when he said he saw. Elijah's word for saw means, remember the hand word that we saw earlier, when he saw what his father, it means that he looked with intent. He was, he was taking it in, which means Elijah would see with intent what, what Jezebel sent, and he saw that and went, ha, 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 ha. If she's got the ability to summon a demon to come after me, I'm kind of over my head on this one. I might want to hightail it out of here. And I think that's what happened with Elijah. He saw that this is scary stuff, man, that this woman has some serious ties to the underworld, if you will, to the evil, malicious ways of Satan, because she does worship a false god. Remember, Dennis and Jambri, did mock the first three signs of Moses. It isn't foreign to us that Satan uses people to mock him in doing signs and wonders. To mock God, that is. And so here you have Elijah, I believe, seeing a demonic spirit going, this is crazy. And he just says, I'm out, see ya. And he just runs because he knows that's not his fight. And so, but it's God's fight. And since God's the one calling him, that's not the right response. Understandable but not justified. Human reaction, that's, I get it, but not the spiritual response, given who he is and who God has prepared him to be, inexcusable. He shouldn't be doing this. Not only that, what's he do? He, he doesn't just run. He arose and went for his life and came to Bathsheba, Beersheba. Look how far this joker ran. So he sees, he sees, he, he, he's in, he goes back, he runs back to Jezreel, is what uh, Ahab does. And they go back to Samaria, the capital of where they're at. And here he is, and, and, and he's in Jezreel, sees this presence of this demon that, he sent, he, that she sent to him. He goes all the way down here, 90 miles. Do you think he's scared? Do you think he's, he's not running from a sense of being a coward. It's not true. He's scared. And when you're scared, you run as far as your feet will take you. You, you, you run hard and fast and long, Jack. You don't stop. I remember when, not to get involved in specific things, but I remember when I've had people that want to do me harm and I just run. When I was bullied in school, I just ran as fast as I could. I didn't care where I was going. I just ran just to get away from them. 
figuring they would give up before I would give up. So that's all I did. So I can just see him being scared of his mind, and he just ran. And you're going to see later on he's scared of his mind. You're going to see that later on his mindset is being challenged by God. The whole thing with Elijah here, it's about a mindset. So, so far at this point, we saw Elijah as a type of mature ones, the foolish and the wise. He's two in one because you see him growing as the foolish virgin to a wise virgin. He's not yet a wise virgin yet. He's not yet a 60 fruit person yet in type. He's still in that 30 fruit yield. You're going, wow, he's doing a lot of mighty things being only a 30 fruit yield person. How does that surprise you? People that know about 30 fruit yield, who know teleoses, who know a, a diania of understanding of God's word and the sperma, they know a lot about the kingdom issues. They know a lot about inheritance and that there's more than one salvation. They know that. They know there's difference of rewards. They know the ver veracity of consequences. They know a little bit about sovereignty. They may not all be locked in on it, but they understand a little bit about that, a little. And so there's different glimpses they have of some other things, but they do have a grasp on the main core foundations of there's a kingdom coming, there's inheritance, there's salvation, there's accountability, there's rewards, and there's positions. They know that, right? And he knows that too. So, but then he goes down to Beersheba. He is scared. Where is he scared? 90 miles. It's about a three-day journey, by the way. As you travel from there to there, you don't get there in one day. That's like a three-day journey on foot. And by the way, later on, he's going to tell God when God asks him, when he finds him later on, even further south, what are you doing here? He said, they're seeking my life, as they always have. That's how he says it in the text, that they've always been doing this. So he's doing this as they're seeking to, to catch him. And so he says in verse uh, 3 again, he came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and he left his servant there. He left his servant here. Notice how the servant does not go any further. So the servant's with him from Zarephath when he comes to uh, he sees him on the way down here, and he goes over to Mount Carmel. He goes all the way down to Beersheba, the servant's with him. Then he goes, that's it. You're done. I'm out. You're going to stay here. That's the widow. The widow's son, that's who I believe. doesn't tell you who it is. Nobody ever tells you who it is. You have to just have your own idea about it. it we know definitively it's not Elisha. It can't be. So it's one of three things. It's either Obadiah, a half-servant who kind of crossed the line, which I don't think he crossed over. He was still, because Ahab and him are still together as serving him serving Ahab. The widow's son or somebody else not mentioned. The only, th the only three choices that you have. There's no other choice. <laughs> and then Elijah, I mean, Elisha would have been mentioned there. Yeah. And it had been him. And, and it's not Elisha. He's later on in chapter 19. I say it's the widow's son. The biggest indication of that is because Elijah said to God later on in this chapter, I alone am left. Well, if you're alone left to not to not deface God as a prophet, where would this servant come from unless it had to be the widow's son that you personally had a two-year tutelage with? How else could you possibly sign off on someone being your servant who worshiped God, the true God, when you are telling God there's no one else but you? The only reason you could, uh, how can this servant be somebody else when he just said there's no one else but him? So you only got really two choices, either Obadiah or the widow's son, in my opinion, when he says that which I believe it's more the widow's son than it would be this, Obadiah guy later on. So, but anyway, so we're going to see, as we continue on in chapter 19, verse 4, he left his servant there in Beersheba, in verse 4, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and he came and sat down under a juniper tree. Now, here's interesting, by the way. Here's where we go to the, you asked me earlier, Nancy, are we going to go to the New Testament today? Yep, we are. Now watch the significance of a juniper tree. And when you hear this, you're going to go, no way. Yes way. Juniper tree grows and guess where? A dry and rocky and open area. It grows on an open area, rocky ground, stony ground. Does that sound familiar to you? Yes, no, no. Does it sound familiar, that whole, the fruits of when the sperm is sown and sown on rocky ground? Now watch this. Now wa watch this now. I think it's just, I saw this and started going, Lord, you have a sense of humor like nobody's business. God's just having a little bit of fun with us and how we spiritually experience our life and how we go through these lessons in life. He's not making fun of Elijah. He's just saying, look, man, it's not, we all go through this. In chapter of 4 of Mark about the sower and the seed of the sperma seed, he said in chapter 4 and in verse, um, let me see here, in verse not, uh, yeah, in verse 5, 
and some fell on the rocky ground where it had not much soil and immediately it vegetated because it had no depth of soil. And the sun having arisen, it was scorched and because it had no root, it withered. Explanation, verse 16 and 17 of Mark chapter 4. And these in like manner are those sown on rocky ground who then when they hear the word receive it immediately with joy. Elijah was, he was on fire, Jack. But having no root in themselves, they are but temporary. Then trial or persecution occurs. Jezebel, I'm going to get you, sucker. On the account of the word, they instantly fall away. He ran like a chicken, like a scaredy cat. Understandable, you're not justified, given what you've been sown, given what you've been sown, given what you've been sown. You can't do that. Is it normal? Sure. Is it justified? No, never. So there you have an issue where with what's going on there. And so I think it's just interesting how you see the juniper tree. Only time it's mentioned in the whole Bible is here. And it grows in a rocky ground. It grows in an open space and a dry area. Because he withered up. He withered. His spiritual growth, God was taking him from. And he just, and he withered. Withered meaning it goes down. And what happens? He goes south. What a coincidence. And not only that, he goes and leaves the servant as if to say, now he's going into full-blown depression, by the way. He's going into full-blown depression. So you go, gosh, I wish someone could, in the Bible, who's a really godly man or woman, show me that they go through depression, because I battle that too, man. I wish it was in there. It is. Elijah is dealing with depression right now. There's no, and I, I'll prove it to you right now. I'm going to show it to you. It, it's all over the place. So here, in, in, verse, in verse 5, of, of well, verse 4, excuse me, of chapter uh, 19, 1 Kings 19, chapter 4. And he sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die and said, Is it enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. Sounds a heck of a lot like Job when he was depressed, when he was alone, when he felt like there was no worth of living any longer. Have you been there in your life? I have. Elijah's been there. Job's been there. Hey, I'm in, I'm in good company. Are you in good company? I can tell you right now, you're not, it's not people oh, a Christian should never think that way. Explain Elijah then, chapter 19, verse 4. Is he evil all of a sudden? No. No. He's human, my God. My goodness gracious. He's human, he's human, he's human. I'm not making fun of him. He's a human being who lost sight, which is easy to do, of the spiritual blessing because the physical benefits now changed. He was, he was flying high, being used by God, flying high, provided by God, flying high, becoming a difference for God. God got his attention, goes back down, flying real high. God used him to cut down the people that are against him. He's flying high, and God superimposed upon him the ability to outrun Ahab. Then all of a sudden, Jezebel comes in. He withers. Persecution comes in. He was flying high, man. All he knew was awesome joy in God in his life. I've always said to people that have type A personalities, you think it's funny when people have emotional sadness. I dealt with this from my brother-in-law who took his life. I can tell you that type A personalities are the ones that have the hardest time when everything around them is devastated and they get crushed because they're not used to it. They don't know how to respond to it. And God forbid, they ever have to deal with it because usually they don't deal with it on a normal basis because that never happens. But when it does, they're so unprepared for it, they don't know what to do. And when you, have, when you have this type of situation here where someone is so emotionally just compromised in Elijah's case, he is compromised. He's emotionally feeling like, I, I, he, he, don't forget, it's not but six months ago, he was living it up with a person he loved, with this woman he loved, this child loved as his own. He had this child right next to him the whole time. How could you not remember the widow herself when her son is with you by your side for six months? And you leave him here as if to say, I, 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 I'm, I'm out. How could you not? He is depressed. He doesn't want anyone around him. He even says so. I want to die. What is my life worth? Are you kidding me, man? Are you kidding me right now? Did you, did you, did, 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 what God did in your life and you're saying this? Then you go, oh, that's right. I do the same thing. Am I kidding myself right now? I don't realize this. Yeah. I, I, I jest sometimes, and I tell babes, I say, I'm fighting that whole thing in my mind right now. It's trying to get to me. That whole depression thing is trying to get to me. That whole sense of trying to make me feel bad about myself. 
and be self-loathing, have my own depressed fest. It's trying to get to me. No, I gotta fight it off. I sense it and I fight it off. I'm being honest with you. I sense it and I fight it off. The difference is I didn't have that ability to do that a couple years ago when that just started happening for me. It wasn't until a few years that I've been able to even sense that and fight that off. Before the last two, three years, it was full blown like, you know, a pendulum of like feeling like Elijah felt right now. I've been there. So I, I hear this guy, I see this, and I'm thinking, I kind of feel good. That I'm not making fun of him, but I'm like, thank you, Lord, for putting this in here to let me know a mighty guy like this was going through a really sucky time in life, if you will. Going through a really bad time, and he was depressed. And they, I feel good. And you never try. And so what your point is over here when he was and he was from Gilead to Tishbite, we don't know what his past is. We don't know. But I would think that he was a loner probably his whole life. And now that he's alone again, feeling alone again, and by the way, I would argue that's some of the point here. I don't know what happened in his life, but I guarantee you if he would have God would have tell us one day, there's gotta be something in his background that was fueling this this sinful mindset of of insecurity about his value and being loved and being self-belonging, because he had he struggled with this stuff. And you'll see this later on as the story unfolds. And, and it gets, it, I actually, I'll be honest with you, I was studying this, and later on, the verses came up, I, I started to cry, because I saw myself, and how God was talking to me, as if I was him. And I just well, started to cry, because I just realized, I've had not that moment that he's talking about with Elijah, but in principle, I have. Oh, I have. And it's very, oh my gosh, it's just very overwhelming. Just think about it. This has been Elijah's first time of feeling victimized. I have a feeling he felt that way quite a few times. Yeah. And it just that. Yeah, you're saying, uh, did, did he feel victimized other times when he was, before he came on the scene with the announcement? Probably so. Like, you ma this, this doesn't drop out of the sky, this feeling. This feeling was already in him, it just got brought to the surface because that's what stress does. It's just like they say, shingles. Is the, is the outflow of people that have chicken pox, it's already in your system now, and stress induces it and it comes to the surface. So you have this, he already had this victimization, this sense of, 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 of loneliness, of, of like, no one's with me, I'm all, I'm all alone. And then he, and God was in his life and he was able to hide it, but then he never dealt with it and it got exposed as soon as the first level of heightened persecution came in, boy, did it get exposed in a bad way. He just wanted to run and get out of there. He couldn't stand up against that, that persecution, that, 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 t that, that fiery demonic, if you will, that's fear of the, the Jezebel can have a demon come after me, I'm out. I, I get it, but my goodness. So it's a pretty traumatic event that happened to him that really triggered his, it wasn't like a side note, oh, I broke my fingernail. Oh, I, I, I failed that test. No, 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 no. This was a very demonstrative moment in his life where he knew his life was literally in the balance and he just got finished making it really clear it's him against the world. When he, what God did with him on Mount Carmel. And now he's hearing, here's a demon coming to get you. I'm gonna make sure at the end of the day, your life is mine. So he's really scared. It's not just like a regular traumatic event. It's, it's a huge fork in the road for him, huge. And he can't deal with it. And so he just runs and gets away, takes the servant with him and then says, you stay here, I'm going down to the wilderness. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I'm just wondering, he might have been like an overachiever. This grandiose moment, he's getting a, Yeah, they, 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 the bigger they are, the harder they fall, they say. In his, in his big moments, he was living it up, but as soon as the hard moments came, he fell like a rock. Man, this is tough. Yes? And Vicki said, Jonah felt like this also, and even Moses. Yeah, the difference, with, difference I would argue, with, uh, with Moses and with Jonah. With Jonah, um, it's a little different mindset there. Jonah was dealing with a whole different world of... of they weren't his own people. He had to go confront. It was Ninevites who were from Assyria who were evil, malicious, wackadoodles. I mean, they were really off the reservation with, with what they were doing and how they killed and, and tortured people. They were the first, many would argue, of the violent, the, the, the earliest kingdom we know about that had a wholesale treatment of human beings with just violent, un, un apprehension. there's no apprehension against how they treated babies, men, women. To, to, to skin you alive, to treat your skulls like soccer balls to their kids, to, to, to killing, to throwing kids in the, in, in the, in the alleyway when they were special needs because they didn't want to deal with, they, they were the most hellacious human beings alive from history we know that's recorded as, as, a, as an empire. 
they were the only empire, they were the first empire we know about that treated human beings as if they were just cast offs. When they wanted to kill them, they killed them, torture them. There was no limits. They were limitless in their evil, hellacious way of treating people. So in Jonah's case, that was his background, that was his context of who he was against, so in his mind. And so I think that's a little different there. Whereas Elijah, it's his own people. This is his family. This is his, this is his Jewish brethren. This is his people. So that's different, right? And then secondly, with, with Moses, so I don't think Jonah, had, it wasn't this, he, you know, he is alone to your point, but he wasn't in the same context of alone amongst his family, amongst his own kindred. He's alone amongst the enemy. So Elijah was alone amongst his own, his own kindred. That's what he felt. Whereas Jonah felt alone amongst the enemy that God was choosing to love. And he's like, I don't agree with that. So similar, but different. And so Moses, I would say, would be different too because at least he had a Pharaoh's daughter that loved him that we had a history of. We have no history of Elijah's upbringing. We don't know if he had a loving mother and father or not. We don't know. But we do know he had some kind of mother that loved him enough to care for him, to raise him up, right, as, own, as, his own, as her own son. Then we also know that he had support of his brother, Aaron, and his sister, Miriam. Miriam, who cared for him and nursed him through the days early on. And then later on, we have Aaron, who was, of course, his right arm right there when the whole the plagues happened. So Moses never had that sense of loneliness like Elijah had. We have people in his life that are earmarked from Pharaoh's daughter, his sister, and his brother. But you don't have that with Elijah. There's no mention until you find him go to Zarephath when he has the widow and her son, which is why you can understand why he got so gravitated toward that, why he held on tight to it. He's like, I never had this before. I mean, if you never had anybody like that in your life, never had somebody love you and care about you and have a vested interest in wanting the best for you in your life, all you have is spiritual blessings of this invisible God and you having this relationship. To be honest with you, the physical, the physical benefits begin to kind of make you kind of go, oh, I might like this a little bit more. <laughs> Because it, it, it's just because it's right now in front of you. I, 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 I get that, but it's wrong. Well, like my, my but I get it. Blood right. But you, your, point, your point is valid, though. Similar to Moses' experience, because he did feel alone, even though they had, they, he felt alone in his spiritual understanding of who God is. No one was with him on that. That's true. But he, but he wasn't alone from a surrounding of those who loved and cared about him, who, who were physically there for memories that were viably true. We have no reference to that in Elijah, except for the two years he was in Zarephath. That's all we have as a reference. But he had any good memories of being physically blessed by having a loving relationship with people around him. Yes? You just said, okay, I see, but the idea that these people are being put through things that bring them to ask to die is seen consistently in Scripture. Yeah. It's, it's pretty crazy how you, you, have this, you have this reference to him saying, take away my life, you know? For I'm not better than my fathers. He's calling himself not better than, remember, he told Ahab that that's what you and your fathers have done. He's putting himself in the same lot as one who worships a false god, one who has totally betrayed God. He feels ashamed. I, I, I can tell you I know how that feels. When you feel that you even, in your mind, if you feel as a person who wants to follow God and wants to serve God and wants to do the best for God, and you in your mind, put something else before him and you know it, or something else is more of what you fear than him, you feel horrible about that. And so in his mind, and I get it, but I've been there. In his mind, he's saying, it doesn't matter if I went off the reservation to the length of Ahab and the rest of those yahoos. In his mind, he's the same. He's the same as them. He's the same as them. So then he says, and he says, and, he, and, and as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, the angel touched him. And the word touched him, it's the word naga. And it means to touch him, to cause an effect. So it didn't just like, it didn't like he touched him, like he just went touched him. No, it means he, he touched him, as if he shook him. That's what it means. As if to say, get up. And he touched him and he said to him, arise and eat. And he looked and behold, there was a cake baked on coals. And a, and a cruise or a jar of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and returned and laid down again. He is depressed. I'm telling you, man, you cannot have your servant with you this entire time that this Mount Carmel thing happens. See what just happened with that hand coming in. Hear that news of that demon thing. Take that servant with you. Say, you stay here. I'm going to go a day in the wilderness. That's already evidence right there. You want to be left alone? 
a sign of depression. You want first sign of depression is you, you, the first sign, the first thing that leads to depression is adversity. Adversity, trauma, situations that are over encumbering this that envelop you, right? They just paralyze you. He had that. That that's the premise of it all. It's where depression it has to come from some type of event. That then later on, what happens is you you don't deal with it. Then it festers. He did that. Then he ran. And then you want to be left alone. He did that. He said, "You stay in Beersheba," and then you feel like you don't want to. Be, you don't want to live. He did that. Then an angel shook him. And you also, when you're depressed, you ignore those that love and care about you. Let's face it, it's real, man. That's what happens. You ignore. You ignore. Yeah, you know, I get it. I get it. Thank you, but no, thank you. You get kind of like, you know, just numb to it. You get kind of placid to their, to their overtures of love and kindness. And the angel shook him and said, get up. He didn't just touch him. He just went, get up. He's like, yeah. And he gave him a cake, which is a disc of like an un unleavened bread wafer, and some water at his head and feet, speaking to the provision God has from him, from his head to his feet, his walk, to his spiritual insight connection, which is where the golden bowl, the head. So God's going to feed him substance of spiritual truth. God's going to water his walk, provide him with the necessary things. God, God is there as his provider, his sustainer. He's his provider and his sustainer. That's what he was trying to say to Elijah with the, with the cake and the water. And what does he do? He eats it and goes, hey, thanks, lies back down again. Do you think the angel woke you up just to eat and go back down again? Come on, man. He's depressed. He does that afterwards. He does. It's coming up in a minute here. So he does that. Then he goes in verse 7. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time. And he said, Arise and eat because your journey or the road is too great for you. And what he's talking about here is Elijah, Elijah being a foolish virgin of 30 fruit yields, a type of a person who has the first portion of the sperma. He doesn't have the second portion. And so what the angel's telling him in typology for us is the second portion of the sperma is great. That road is greater than you think. It isn't just like a next step into the natural progression. Oh, it's a huge step to take on the next level of what you already know, to go from a Dianea general understanding of wisdom to a Sunimi detail understanding of wisdom, using the Greek words. That's a, not, 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 it's just a regular, that's a big step. It's a huge step, is what he's saying. It's a big demarcation from what you used to know about me, Elijah, and what I've told you versus where I'm calling you to be. I knew about Jezebel's threat to you. I orchestrated that whole thing. Not for you to be scared, but to rely on me. And what is, and what the angel tells him again, I'm doing this because I need to, you need to have the substance. You need an extra measure of substance to have for the journey. The next step in your progression, it takes more wisdom, more insight from God's word and to, to dwell on his sustaining and, and provision in his word. And in verse 8, it says, and he arose. Finally, he arose after that comment. But I'm telling you, he was depressed. He laid down again. The angel had to shake him twice. Unbelievable. Touched him a second time, shook him twice. Wake up. Finally, in verse 8, he arose. He ate and he drank. And he went in strength. He went in the strength of that, of that substance, of that, that food. 40 days and 40 nights. That word went in strength. It's interesting enough, by the way, he only had bread, remember? There was no meat here, it was bread. And before, Brother Todd joked about when he was over here and the, and the other side of the Jordan River, he was fed by that brook by the meat. God actually was his personal chef, giving him meat every day from those ravens, remember? He had meat and bread every day. So over here, he says that he arose and did eat and did drink, and he went in strength. That word strength means a great and powerful might. In other words, that must have been supernatural, because you can't have bread and water and be mighty strengthened, but having no protein. That doesn't make much sense. But unless you're talking about the, the spiritual side of things that he's talking about here, because he went through this whole process, and now he just took a three-day journey down here. Another day, he's on day five of this journey now, 
and this is what this happens. I, I don't find this five number for grace, because remember, three day journey from, from where he was in Samaria down to Beersheba, 90 miles, and then another day he says by himself, and then this happens. And he went, and he says, in for, he went in strength, 40 days he went in strength, and 40 nights, which again, they number for trial and testing, as we know, 40. God tries and tests the people of Israel, 40, for this 40 years in the wilderness, 40 days and nights, we know that's how much it rained on the earth. Jesus in the wilderness himself, tempted 40 days. But look where he goes, 40 days and 40 nights, unto Horeb, the mountain of God. Whoa, 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 whoa. So now he's bringing Elijah back to the core of it all. Like, you weren't even a people until I was appeared unto Abram, until Abram then developed his kindred from which came out Moses, from which I gave him the Ten Commandments, which I made the law. And it all happened right here on Mount Horeb where the law came out. And so he's bringing them to that place, Ma Mount Sinai, and there, this, this area where Horeb is at. And he says, and he came and he came thither into a cave. So he knew where he was at. So God's bringing him to a place that's near holy ground. So if I can, on the board, if I can on this map somewhere find, if I could. He went, he went to the wilderness, didn't hear. And then he goes, he gets in the wilderness, it's right down here. And I'm trying to find out. So they don't have it on here. But you go, he, he goes down even further down in here. So he's down, this is Mount Sinai. He's down, he's down in this area down here. So he goes from Beersheba, the wilderness, after one day. Then he goes all the way down to here. And so in relationship to all that, he has this whole situation going on. He has this whole situation going on where he's, He's actually saying, look, he has, he's gone all the way down here and he hides in a cave. You've got to be kidding me. I mean, look how far. He was up here, man. He was in Samaria. Where is it at? Right up in here by Shek. He was, he goes all the way. This dude, I mean, and he's hiding in a cave. He's hiding in a cave. That's why the angel said the journey's too great. You think this three day plus this one day, you think this four day journey so far is great? Oh no. On day five, he goes, um, you need God's grace to sustain you for the next part of this journey. You're going down south, buddy. You're going to go to Holy Ground where it's all started from. Yes? Uh, first of all, Vicki said my notes in the Bible has the first touch as the sporos and the second is the sperma. You say it's rather sperma one and sperma two, and Pam said that's my question too. Yep. Yep. It's not sperma one, it's not, it's not sperma one and sperma two. It's that's probably old notes from what we didn't understand before. But it's the sperma one, but it's first portion, second portion of sperma one. That's what this is. We didn't understand that before when those notes were written, when you had those notes probably written there. So it's the same sperma, but it's first portion, second portion. So remember, Peter represents the first portion of sperma being sown, not a slouch. He's a mighty man in the book of Acts. And Paul represents the second portion of sperm being sown, and also the second seed as well. But was Peter a slouch? By no means. He did mighty things in the book of Acts, all the way from chapter 1 all the way through chapter 10, as you see, and even chapter 11. But you see also the relevance of the big difference between the two of them. The same with Elijah and Elisha. Elijah was that portion one until this point. And now he's realizing portion two, it's a lot greater than he ever realized. He didn't know. He assumed upon God he was the only one. He assumed he was done. There was more. Yes? Jim said I have the same notes, and Vicki said what would the word of the Lord be in verse 9? In verse 9? Okay. Yes. So the word of the Lord here is a reference to, I would tell you that's going to be sperma number one, second portion. Okay? So this is what he's talking about. By the way, it's, you're right on point what I'm going to get to here is that phrasing there is talking about him introducing to him the, the magnitude of the framework of what's expected and what is demanded when you get to that second portion of sperma one. If you think it's, in other words, you think it's bad enough to be persecuted because you're talking about inheritance, salvation being different? You think that's bad? You think it's bad because you understand there's more than one salvation? You think it's bad because you understand there's consequences in the next life when you die and face Christ, being in Christ? You think it's bad that your fellow people in Christ don't look at you as a normal human being, they make fun of you. Be prepared for a heightened level of turning up the, the, the burner 
uh, onto full hatred when you start getting involved in multiple salvation, not just two, but eight. Not just salvation and inheritance, but inheritance of the earth and heavens. Oh, not just a, a marriage feast in general where only a few go, but there's two different levels of marriage feast. Oh, and so on, and so on, and so on. Well, I'm turning up the dial, baby. So he's telling, he's telling Elijah, you think it's bad now, persecution? It only gets worse. It only gets more intense, my friend. You should know this. You should know this. By the mighty man that you are and how you've lived your life, how you came on the scene like you did, you should know this by, by what happened. You know, he should know this. When he came on the scene and he did what he did and he comes back, you should know this. It should not be a foreign concept to you that there's probably a lot more than what I realized. But he's a type of people that say, you know what? Since I'm already so unique, I'm already so different, I'm all there is. I am the end. I, uh, this is the arrival of the new understanding of God's word. Because when you start comparing yourself to the majority, with uh, which Elijah did, you feel like, I'm the measuring stick. I'm it. And that's exactly what foolish virgins do. That's exactly what, Di what Diania understanding people do. They continue to want to prop themselves up by putting around them people that they know are nothing close to them. Forgetting and not realizing that the journey is too great. Ahead of you is where you're supposed to be focused. Don't settle in for, the, for, the, for this idiocy of mindset that I'm gonna compare myself to people around me and think I'm, therefore, I, I, am I not fortunate and blessed? I know so much more about God and his word. He's given me so much more. It doesn't, oh my gosh, that's not the point. That's not the point, man. The point is to continue to move, continue to grow. And he's telling Elijah, the journey's too great. You need more substance from God on this. And you're not relying on him like you're supposed to here. So he has, again, he gets, he gets strengthened by this bread and by this water, 40 days, 40 nights, a type of trial and testing, which speaks to the movement between, again, Dianea, foolish virgin status, to Sunni wise virgin status. It takes a trial and a test. It takes a really big gut check moment to go through that first portion of sperma to second portion of sperma. Hence, verse 9, the word of the Lord is about to introduce to you what that second portion is. He's about to tell you, yes. No, good point, good question. Matthew 13 is sperma number two. Mark four is sperma number one. The difference that you see in, in Mark four and about what you just mentioned there is that the, the issues of 30, 60, and 100 and how they're demarked, if you go back to Mark four, I already still have mine open. So if you go to Mark four, if you remember when he says 130, 160, 100 is is to hear the word and accept it and bear. And so remember in the aspect of Matthew, it's yield and bear, remember that? Do you remember that phrasing? To remind you, so you go to Matthew, so there is a, there is a first portion of sperma two that's being sown now, which is in Matthew 13, because remember both spermas have first and second portion. So if you remember, just kind of compare this off, off note, but it's a good, good comment you're making, so in Matthew 13, when he goes into, I'm going to find out where we're at here. There it is. On, left, on, the, on verse 23 of Matthew 13, it's he who considers and obeys the word, which again bears and yields. So he bears fruit and he has a yield. There's a gain and a, and a yield. So there's a gain in the principle, but there's also an interest off the principle. There's both. So he has two different things in Matthew 13, again, because I was just speaking of two different portions there. Whereas over in, in Mark 4 and verse um, 20, he says that he hears the word and he has to accept it and he bears it. And the word accept there is come alongside, para, he accepts it, but the word is in the plural, in the AI at the ending. The suffix at the ending is the plural. He has to ongoingly accept it, speaking to a first and second portion. So. The, the parables themselves aren't demarcating first, second portion between the two parables. They're demarcating the portions within the parable. So Mark 4 has two portions of, of sperma, and so does Matthew 13. They both do. In Matthew 13, it's veiled with the bearing and yielding, and in Mark 4, it's, it's in the 
bearing and accepting, if that helps to make sense. So it's a good question, it's a great question, but you'll see the difference there and how that, that is. Hopefully you can see that. And so that answers that question, I hope, from what you're asking. But to go back to this, this story now, Elijah's now in a cave. He came to this cave and he lodged there overnight, which means the way it says lodged, it says it like he intended to stay there for the long haul. The way it's written here is he did it on a permanent basis. He did not do it a temporary basis. His mindset was, I'm just gonna hang out here until indefinite. <laughs> you know, he's just gonna hang out here. So by the way, when, when you're depressed, you don't, do you have, a, you have an end in your, I mean, I'm telling you right now, I, I've been there. If you haven't been there, then you don't know. But if, when you're in that state, there's no sense of, oh yeah, on the 5th of May, I'll come out of this. You, you don't do that. You just simply go, I'm here for as long as I need to be here. You don't care. You don't care. Evidence by when he said my life should be ended, my father's, I'm worse, I'm just like them. You just, you, you, you degrade yourself, you feel bad about yourself, you don't, you don't wanna live anymore. And that all goes in line with, when you stop and, and hide out in a cave, there's no end date to that. You, his mindset was, till I die, I guess. I, I'm not going anywhere else. So then, no, and, it, and it's, it's ironic because he's still depressed even though the angel shook him twice. Good gracious, my gosh. It's like d God is getting your attention. That wasn't enough, so God himself then comes to him and goes, hello. Like, <laughs> and then Elijah's like, yes, sir. Like, it's pretty, that's pretty, I mean, that, that's what happens, by the way. God sends gentle proddings of people in your life that love you. He'll do provisions in your life, but then when he himself gets in your life, and I can testify to this, it's a convicting reality, but it's also a needed reality to snap you out of that depression. I can testify, I've been through this. Not this exactly, but this principle I have. Oh yes, I have. Yes? Lainey, <coughs> Lainey said asking for prayer, had Jezebel and had to have hospice here to help. He is depressed over all of this, thank you. Uh, be with her father right now, be with Lenny's dad, and help him to get good healing and a situation that to be sustained and get him back to some sense of good blood flow and good good thoughts and just let you know your love and your presence in his life and strengthen everybody around in Jesus' name, amen. So sorry to hear that. I hope that you got it. So the word of the Lord came to him and he said to him, what doest thou here, Elijah? Now, do you see what God's asking? Do you, do you think that God's going, I wonder why you're here? Now, people who believe in free will would say, God's trying to seek information, really? God's trying to figure out why he's there. Why did you come here, I wonder, I don't know. Of course he knows why he's there. He's asking Elijah to verbalize it, just like God did to Abraham. And he asked Adam to verbalize it. Yeah. He, he said, Abraham's like, oh, I can sacrifice my own son. He's like, God goes, I knew you loved me, but now you know the level of which you love me. Look what you're willing to do. That's crazy. God already knew, but he wanted us to be brought to the task in real time to, to experience it. <laughs> so God knew this is all gonna happen. It's all been ordained. He ordained all of this. But he wants Elijah to answer the question, do you know why I ordained all this? Why are you here? Do you know why I've ordained this? Do you know why? You don't understand about the second portion of the sperma? Do you know why you're living in a Dianea understanding of who I am and you, you've sh fallen short of the Sunni understanding? Do you know why I let you have the widow and her son and I let you have all these experiences beforehand? Do you know why? Do you know why? Why are you here? Why are you here? Not just here in this world, not just here in, in the calling I have on your life, but at this exact point in your life, all things being said, how I made you, why I made you, the experiences I've given you, this particular thing you're going through right now, the journey you've been on, the place that you're at right now, hide now. Why are you here? Do you understand the orchestrated thing? It bears the mind to witness. Let's go back again. I say this, but I, I gotta go back. Go to, go to First Peter. Go to First Peter. I gotta show you this. This it's just, this has got to be one of your this has got to be one of your your flagship verses for the rest of your life. In, in, in this, because this is, this is awesome. 1 
First Peter chapter 4, verse 11, if anyone speak, let it be as the oracles of God. If anyone serve, let it be as from the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, who is the glory, the power for the ages of the ages. Amen. And it says, if one, let it be from the strength which God orchestrates, choreagios, that's the word, supplies. God orchestrates everything in our lives to bring about the glory of God in our lives. Everything. And God's telling Elijah, why are you here? I orchestrated everything for my glory. So again, why are you here? I just gave you the answer of the cheat sheet. Why are you here? How does that filter into why you are here? Uh, he goes, um, okay, verse 10. And, I, and, and he said, uh, I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. Yahweh Elohim and Sabaoth. For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and slain prophets with the sword. And I, only I, am left to remain. And they seek my life intensely, repeatedly. It's written in the language, the PL language, the grammar. They repeatedly, intensively seek my life to take it away. Do you think Elijah's response is what God was looking for? Let me answer that question for you. No, it was not. And by the way, God gives him this demonstrative example. He asks the question again, gives him the same answer. Are you kidding me? Boy, you're slow in the head, buddy. You're a little slow up here, bro. Come on, man. But then I go, no, he's not slow. He's like me. I'm like him. I, I've been there. We all do that. Don't act like you're better than Elijah. God has talked to you, too, on multiple times about the same thing, and you keep on with the same answer. And he's like, okay, uh, that's wrong. That's not the answer I'm looking for. Let me give you the answer God gives to him in response. It looks like in response, but God then gives him a provision of an answer that is like uh, yowza. So in verse 11, he said, go, stand upon the mount before the Lord. By the way, he's at Mount Horeb, right? Go stand upon, first of all, he's already on holy ground where his forefathers, he just mentioned he's no better, he's no better than his fathers. He's talking about the Israelites of old that have all worshipped golden calves, the false idols God has killed and destroyed. I should be killed and destroyed too. I'm no better than all of them. I just forsook everything. After all you've used me for, I ran. I'm scared. I don't, I, 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 I'm tired of letting you down, God. I'm tired of not living up to what you want me to be. I can't do it anymore. <laughs> and then God says to him, as he's hiding in the cave, Paraphrase, get up, son. Stand your butt up on top of that mountain right now. Now! And he gets him up. Like, like, talk, I, I, it reminds me how God talked to Job. Like, get up. Don't you dare act like you're weak at the knees when you're talking to me. Don't you even, don't you even, don't. Don't even, don't even think it. Don't even say it. You get up now. And he got up. Yes, sir. Do you know how much I love you? How much I've invested in you? How much I care about you? You know I would never, ever leave you alone like this. Let me remind you of who I am. So he says, before the Lord, you stand before the Lord at the face of the Lord. Right, in other words, and right in my presence. Of Chaveh, the authoritative, all-existent one. And behold, Chaveh passed by. Now, whoa, 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 whoa. The last time that reference was uh, Moses on a mountain, and God passed by him. And his face shone bright, and his hair turned white. He just got a cleave in a cleave, a cleft of a rock. Got a glimpse of his backside. You think that Elijah wasn't thinking this? Because I know darn well I'd be. I'm not even a Jew, and I think that. I know he was. I know he was. He was right there. He's going. This, this is crazy. So God comes by in a great, strong wind, and it split the mountain, Jack. Just the wind. Do, do you understand? Like. And the mountain goes. Now, if I'm Elijah, I'm like, are you kidding me right now? The mountain just split in half just because of a wind. Are you crazy right now? How did that happen? God's getting his attention. That there's nothing I can't do, but there's more to the story than that. There's a lot of typology in this, too. First thing he says after that, first thing after that, he says, a great strong wind split the mountain and break in pieces the rock. 
That means repeatedly and more intensely because of this splitting of the mountain, you saw rock just falling off continuously. Because when you split to a big, gigantic boulder in half, a big, gigantic mountain, rock's still going to be falling down from the aftermath of that, that big action. He's seeing this. And he says, before the face of the Lord, of Yahweh. But the Lord was not in the wind, unlike with Moses, where that was God who passed by him. God was not in the wind. God was just causing the wind. <laughs> and by the way, don't you find it coincidental that later on he says earthquake, then he says fire, then he says a still small voice, a whisper. It's so, wow. So he says the next thing, and after the wind, an earthquake. But in verse 11, last part, but the Lord, Kave was not in the earthquake. Verse 12, and after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord, Kave was not in the fire. And then after the fire, a still, small voice. It means a whisper of calm, as if to say, Elijah. Let me get this straight. You want me to hear, <laughs> That comes and does. Another big earthquake. Blah, 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 blah. Then fire. Whoosh, and all of a sudden, Elijah. That, do you, the contrast of that is amazingly crazy. That is just wow. And what is God doing? Genesis, the spirit moved over the face of the waters. God constantly uses the word ruach for his spirit, for the wind. God moved in, his, in, the, in the wind. Then in Noah's day, he, to restore the earth, to restore the earth, to restore the earth. Then what does he do in Noah's day? He shakes the earth. And he shakes it by raising up the mountains and lowering the valleys to displace the waters. He shook the earth to do what? To restore the earth, to restore the earth, to restore the earth. What's he going to do when the fire comes again? Destroy the earth with fire. For what reason? To restore the earth, to restore the earth. Then when it's all said and done, and all that judgment restoration is done, what is God saying to us? It's just you and him, us. It's just us and him, and it's still small voice. All the, all the demonstrations, all the different things, that have, they're all done. They're in the past. It's just where do, where do you stand in your relationship with Almighty God? Where, how do you trust your God, your Father that loves you? How do you trust in him as your provider, your sustainer? Do you really understand the depth of his love that can bring you out of that sense of despair? Because that's what the still small voice is about, that yeah, yeah, I do all those things, but I'm not in those things. I do those things. Me and you, we have an endearing, loving, calm, unbelievably tight relationship of provision and love based upon my continual outflow of, pro of providing for you and loving you, no matter what. It's amazing. But even more so when you obey to that extra level and extra measure. What an amazing... I, but in light of all of that, what happens? And so it became. Elijah heard it, the small voice. And as it, it's the way he says he wrapped. And it means as the result of the small voice and of the wind and of the earthquake and of the fire. But the, but the result he has is of the voice he heard. And Elijah heard it, and he, as a result, wrapped himself tight, his face and his mantle, and went out and stood in the opening of the cave. So Elijah hears, hears the small voice after the, the, loud, the loud, the loud renting of a mountain. I mean, the wind. The fire. And, and he goes, no. I, I don't know about you, but if you ever, I think this is the, this is the, this is going to sound weird me saying this. Don't take this the wrong way. But the beauty of an abusive lifestyle I've been through, been through, is I can understand what this is like. When you have someone beat you and someone abuse you and then, and then you got, you, they throw in stuff, they're hitting you, and stuff is broken. You got bleeding, you got bruises, you got pain. You're trying to hide. And then when they calm down, 
they, they go, you okay? Uh, and you tend to be like, you're scared. Unless you've been there, you don't know what that's like. I'm telling you, you're scared. You're, even though they're sacked and calm now, you're still scared. Elijah is scared. God brought forth the mentality of this is what he's capable of. He showed him the typology of his wind and spirit restored the earth in Genesis, shook the earth in Noah's day to restore it, and will by fire restore it once again in the future. Not to scare him, but to show him that God's judgments are just part of him. That's not him. He's not in the, that's part of his, who he is. He's not in, he's not a judgmental God. He's a loving, caring, giving, long-suffering, compassionate, accepting God. And Elijah got scared. He got scared. So scared, what's he do? When God asks him the question, he gives the same answer. Exactly. And God says to him again, And behold, there a voice came to him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? Look in verse 10, look in verse 14. It's the same. He said, I've been very jealous of the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken the covenant and thrown down the altars and slain the prophets with the sword. And I only I am left and the sleep of my life taken away. I've already heard that answer. Do you not understand why? You, you, so let me get this straight. Since when does the teacher and tutor in any classroom ask you for the answer? You give it. They don't acknowledge your answer as being good. They go to the board and they put down a whole different lot of lessons to learn and they say, what, what's your... What's your answer to that? You give the same answer. What part of your head is not gathering in that there's a lesson to be learned here you're missing? What part of your, your hard-headedness, your stubbornness, your presumption upon God, your depression? There's many things that led to this. Presumption upon God, stubbornness, egocentric, self-centered, not seeing from God's perspective but his perspective, all these different things. Rejection, fear, disappointment. One thing it's not. It's not looking at it from a spiritual eyes and lens of who God wants us to be and who God is in our lives. So after he said that in verse 14, same exact answer. Elijah didn't learn. What's God's response? Next. You go, what? Well, yeah. Yeah, it's not a joke. God said, next. What's the response to the foolish virgins when they say, knock at the door, he says, no, I don't know you. What? Next. Go. The, what? The door's shut. I'm done. God shut the door right here on Elijah. Look at verse 15. And by the way, I don't think it's coincidental to that he asked Peter three times, do you love me? I think the third time he's going to ask Elijah in Revelation, why are you, why are you here? He's going to say, oh, I know I'm here. Now I know. That's why he's coming back. Because God loves him too much to end his life like this. He's going to come back and say, oh, now I, now I know. I know why I'm here. Oh, I know. Oh, I know. Oh, I know real good why I'm here. So in verse 15, he says, And the Lord said unto him, Go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. Now look at that. He has to go all the way. Look at that. Are you serious right now? Look how long that is, that journey. That's, that, that's insane. Go return. Oh, by the way, when you go there, you're going to anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. You know, the king that's going to outlive you, that guy. I want you to anoint people that are going to outlive you. I want you to bring upon the mantle on people that I have ordained to outlive you, to, to go on beyond you, to remind you that you fell short, that there is more that was intended if you understood that correctly, and there is going to be more expected of you. You're going to anoint Hazael. Let's be on Elijah's 852, and he goes off the earth in the chariot of fire. Jehu also lives longer than him, and, and so does Elisha, the three that God tells him to anoint. What a coincidence. I don't think so. I don't think so. Your blessings are cut short, Elijah. He said, anoint Hazael, the king of over Syria, and then Jehu, the son of Nimshi, thou shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Embalaha, thou shalt anoint to be prophet in thy stead. Ouch. 
That's like Moses hearing, you're not going to go in. Stop with the conversation. This is that Elijah typology to Moses. He's knowing right here and right now he just fell short. This sucks. This is a moment in life you'd ever want to hear. The beauty of Moses and Elijah is they get a do-over. Well, not a do-over. They get an extra measure, I should say. It's not a do-over. It's an extra measure of opportunity they got. But I, I got to tell you, not many folks get that, obviously, right? But they did. They will get future. But this is the same thing. And he's, he's feeling it right now. I can, just, I can just feel his heart, man, breaking, going, oh, my God. You're going to be kidding me. You, you asked me, I, why did I ask this? Why did I answer the same way twice? What is wrong with me? And now he's hearing the, the mantle fall down, the, the, the gavel's fallen, the judgment's done. There, you can't just, no, you're, and you're stead to Elisha. Oh, I want to do it. No, it's over. Like Joshua takes your place, Moses, it's over. No, no, I want, I want, nope. Da, da, da. It's over. My decision's final. God, that sucks. <laughs> after all the work that I have done, after all the, I see, I have done, after all the things that you used me for, this sounds going to end? Ah. Oh, me passing the mantle to someone else. I don't, I don't get to see the finality of this. I don't get to experience the blessings of, of the rewards. Yes. It already happened, yeah. He 40 days and 40 nights unto Horeb. He fasted that way until he got to the cave. Yes, this is after that. God was preparing him for this, for this experience. So that the, the fasting he had was for the, for the preparations for this experience. That was the trial and testing for the second measure of the sperma to be received the right way. And he still wasn't ready. It's like, oh my goodness. Yes? When he said, why is God anointing the king of Syria? Pam said, Daniel 2, 21, God removes kings and raises up kings. Yeah, God, yeah, God just anointed the king of Syria just to show that God uses all the emissaries around Israel and around the entire planet to do as he wishes. God anoints all authorities and all governments and so forth. And so, yeah, he's just, I know it sounds kind of odd. You're thinking maybe it's only Israel God's going to anoint. He's just mentioning that um, he's putting in place all governments, all powers, all wealth. There's an old scripture that God says, I give all wealth, which is interesting. People say, well, well, then why is evil, per evil couldn't persist if it didn't have a resource. Think about that. Evil wouldn't persist in the same dynamics if it didn't have resources. If all the wealth was with, with the righteous people, they would have more resources to squelch the evil. But the fact that evil is prevalent because they have more, re it's more prevalent, it always would be prevalent, but it's more prevalent because they have more resources. They have more resources because they have wealth. Who gave them the wealth? God. That is wild. Think about that. Yeah, just in the unjust. God says, don't, don't try to figure it out. Just know that I did it all. I'm like, goodness gracious. Yes. Yeah, John's appointed by God, just like every president has been. Every, every world leader has been appointed by God. Everyone. Obama, Hitler, ugh, Stalin, Mussolini. Ugh. They're all appointed by God. Not just the good ones, the ones you like. All of them. Every single last bit leader. Even the Pharaoh who killed all the babies. Herod, Pilate. All anointed by God. All appointed by God. So as far as the Syria people accepting the anointing, obviously that's because, uh, to your point, that's an interesting comment because it is interesting to know that a Jewish prophet comes in there and anoints a non-Jewish king, a foreign enemy, <laughs> and they're going to accept that. I, you would think it's because obviously there was some demonstrative display there, I would think, by God to let them know that this was a supernatural uh, anointing. It's a great question because I don't think they would have accepted that if it was without some type of, because they seek signs, Gentiles do, right? So I would think there had to be some type of a dem demonstration from God to let them know that this is sanctioned by him. And they would go, oh, because back then, anybody that was not Israelite, well, especially the Jews too, but they seek these signs, the Jewish people do, and the Gentiles seek wisdom. And they, if they saw the fact there was, there was some insight to things or there was a sign to things, they would know that this was of God. So I'm thinking something was there. Some wisdom was shared, some signs were shared, something, to, to your point, to make them accept this, that this appointment. It's a good question, fair question. No. Uh, exactly. And he's anointed someone that is uh, in covenant with like a wrestle with the dream. And so he's anointed someone like that who I can meet with with Elisha. But I, uh, to me, Elisha is in the New Testament. 
He does. Elisha's in test. And the reason why he's anointing him, by the way, is because he's going to use him, as he says, to bring justice upon those who worship the false god Baal. He says whoever doesn't fall by Hazel's sword will fall by Jehu's sword. Whoever doesn't fall by Jehu's sword will fall by Elisha's sword. So he brings that up. It's the next, it comes up for the next point. He just says, uh, it says in the verse 17, And it shall come to pass that him that escapes the sword of Hazel shall Jehu slay. Him that escapes the sword of Jehu will Elisha slay. Yet I have left, I have, I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all of the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which has not kissed him. So look how they say that twice. And by the word, he says left over. So again, he's, the reason he anoints Hazel is because he's using a foreign emissary, as he does in previous times, to buffet those who are disobedient in Israel. He does that many times in scripture. That is not foreign at all. He does that with Cyrus, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Bel Belshazzar, I mean, you name it, Alexander the Great, Pilate, Herod. He does this, he uses outsiders to, to be used as exercising his judgment upon his people to accomplish his will. He does that constantly through scripture. You see it to all the kingdoms and the Pharaoh, the same as well as the Egypt days as well, right? So, but interesting enough, he says, again, those, those who escape Hazel will go under Jehu's sword, under Jehu's sword they escape him, under Elisha's sword. He says there was a few that will have a leftover. And interesting, notice how he says, he didn't say who haven't bowed unto Baal, he said haven't bowed their knee to Baal, or have not with their mouth kissed him, which I believe again, is a similitude of the typology of the revelation issue of those who worship the beast and take his mark. Bowing is worshiping. Kissing is taking on the mark. You're 